Hello and welcome to a very special little video that we're putting together in which we have a very special guest, my good friend Thomas Felix Crichton, who is known to most of us as Fleming Never Dies. And you have very kindly, Thomas, come to, to talk to us uh, about, well, we were discussing the, the whole issue with the estate of Ian Fleming mucking around with the words of Ian Fleming mm -hmm. before publishing his novels. But uh, you had some, some great ideas about talking uh, about the, the larger spectrum of fandoms and fandoms changing hands and fandoms changing canon and stuff like that. And it all stems from, I don't know how many people know this about you, but the fact that you are a secret Star Wars fan. <laughs> I am, I am. I've been keeping it secret for many, many years. But yep, Star Wars is, for me, it. It is it. I'm a huge Star Wars fan and always have been. Now, you're not alone. It's funny. I think with the James Bond community, there are a lot of... Lot, it's like Elvis and the Beatles. You know, there are a lot who like Star Trek and there are a lot who like Star Wars. No one ever likes Star Trek as much as Star Wars or Star Wars as much as Star Trek. But there are a lot of Star Wars fans. David Zeritsky, huge Star Wars fan. Apparently, yeah. he, he yeah. said he had this, like, this come to Jesus moment where it's like, do I become a Bond fan or a Star Wars fan? And he picked Bond because it was like more... Mm -hmm. I'm sure his wife, Danielle, was, was grateful for that because he gets to dress beautifully <laughs> and, and stuff like that. So Star yeah. Wars, to be an, an overt Star Wars fan is kind of... Um, <laughs> it's less cool. It can be worrying. Bond. Yes, yes. I mean, if I'm going to work, I don't want to wear a Star Wars T-shirt. Um, I don't wear a lot of T-shirts generally. So for that kind of thing, <laughs> Bond is something, if it's practical, then it will generally be Bond, right? So whether yeah. it's, say, the... Was it the shaving soap dish that Bond uses in Skyfall? I use that every day. Um, so yeah. it's like things that I'm using, things that are in my hands, you know, the ties, the suits, I'm wearing those, so it's useful. So that's a Bond thing. Um, as for, you know, things that I'm collecting or whatever, well, some things, you know, just have to be had. Um, so uh, this is obviously just a regular toy. You know, <laughs> many, many people at home may have them, and I hope they're waving them around right now. Uh, I can show you some that's the next level, though. The next level. Definitely, definitely. Next level Ooh. stuff. So... This is very special because I made it. Um, and I made it because a toy like this appears for, in my favorite Clone Wars episode, the TV show, the animation. I absolutely love that episode. And so I connected online with some other fans and they showed me how to make this. And there's a great Star Wars kind of modeling community, costuming community, all these things uh, of basically creating this world and then using it like as a channel and a springboard for your own creativity. Oh, that's wonderful, which is one of the reasons why we love getting involved in this stuff. I mean, yeah. I, I mean, in the Bond community alone, you you do such great stuff. Anyone who's not following your Instagram account is really <laughs> missing out because you look the part. I remember I've got one of the old <laughs> pan, pan James Bond books and it's got the James Bond with his dark hair and the comma of his own. I'm like, if you squint your eyes, that could look like Thomas. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's the uh, Celtic genetics. I <laughs> <laughs> so... Oh, no. Oh, I was so one of the things is, yeah, we are all James Bond fans, and the estate mm. of Ian Fleming has decided as they are prepared to to re-release the books for the 70th anniversary, they've decided to to rewrite certain segments, which seems to be like the the thing that everyone's doing now. They tried mm. to do that with Roald Dahl, they're trying to do that with the Goosebump books by R.L. Steen. Yeah. And then Ian Fleming, though, that's uh, that's got a lot of people, including myself, up in arms. But it's not yeah, well, yeah. go ahead. Yeah, yeah, and it, it, it's astonishing to me the idea that, you know, present day is so advanced. This is the apogee of humanity. We're never going to have any more advances. Everything before is just a mistake. This moment in time now is what decides. And as somebody who loves history, and I love to look at history and understand things from their point of view, because, of course, you know, I've lived in China, I've lived in Saudi Arabia. Things are very, very different there. Um, you know, the Marvel movies, as they're being released, I see the different adverts, which I think have become quite renowned. Um, you know, Black Panther, totally different posters for China as the rest of the world. Um, and so, as I say, this idea that, okay, modern day America is it, the bar for human behavior, uh, I find really interesting. Yeah, and I mean, that, that's what bothers me. It's like, I know in uh, Live and Let Die, they're, they're taking, they've decided because they don't want to, to have too many uh, negative racial um terms about things because we the people described people of different ethnicities differently mm. then in some cases they took out the racial descriptors entirely so like a black yeah. doctor or a black immigration officer is now just a doctor or a, an immigration officer whereas to me part of what makes that 
part of the reason Ian Fleming included that in the beginning was because in the 1950s, it was unusual to have a black doctor. So it was significant. Yeah. It's kind of, that's historical context. The people who made these decisions, at Ian Fleming publications, missed mm. out on completely. And that's, and it's sad to me. Yeah, yeah, and, I, and I, I got this idea from someone that it's kind of making it softer as a softer entry point for people who aren't aware of that history. But, you know, anytime I hear something like that, you know, I've worked in adult education most of my adult life, and I was like, the way you deal with that is to teach. The way yes. you deal with that, you know, give the context, you know. Um, so some of the Fleming books I have have, uh, you know, an introduction by somebody. Um, and I think that's just a, a much better way of dealing with it. Absolutely. Now, uh, moving on from there, let's, uh, there are other fandoms mm. and other kind of things. And let's talk about Star Wars, because, you know, Star Wars for most for, for most casuals, I guess, it's just the series of movies. Um, mm. But it goes far beyond that. You've got the TV shows. I've been watching The Clone Wars with my 11 year olds and it's like bloody good. It's yeah. really, really good stuff. We started watching the first few seasons, you know, were just fun. And then as it goes on, it's kind of like compelling. I'm like, oh it my god, is. Ahsoka's been dismissed from the Jedi Order. And... <laughs> Don't give spoilers. <laughs> Some people might not have seen it. <laughs> um, no, and it's I, a fantastic. And it fills in the st you see people on the, the movies uh, for a second, like mm. Commander Cody or something, and then it fills in their entire life history. Boba yeah. Fett is in the movies for a second, and then our my my entry point into that, we bought online all of these Boba Fett books for my yeah. son. We just finished reading all of them. Um, and my wife very patiently has been getting other books for him. But the thing that I wasn't, the two things that I was aware of, unlike Star Trek, Star Wars, it was every book, every comic book, everything like that, they were always canon. Is that true? Yes. Uh, but broadly, yes. Yeah. It all ties together in the expanded universe. There are tiers of canon, but generally they were very good with it and made sure everything connected. <laughs> so if you read about a lady when she was 20, you might be reading a book set 20 years later, now she's 40, and you would get that time filled in. You might get a bit of a backstory in a video game or in a comic. Like you will encounter these interesting people at different points in their lives in different mediums, which I think is wonderful. It's like watch, yeah. watching the Boba Fett show at the moment. Having read these books, it's kind of fun to have seen how Boba yeah. Fett, as an orphan teenager, became the world's badass bounty hunter. Yeah, yeah, and you know, there's a one-shot comic. There was a trilogy by K.W. Jetta, who was very, very influenced by you know things like "Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep?" So you get really different tones of stuff as well. There's things that you gravitate towards as, a, as an adult, as a teenager, as a young kid. Stuff that tries to be for everyone, uh, but you know, for different types of readers, there's different uh, books available. And there's something else you said to me, which uh, I, I don't think people fully appreciate. And the fact is that all of the people who wrote Star Wars books weren't were, were like very well respected mm. authors. Um, and I think that yeah. surprises people. Yeah, yeah. I mean, these, these are, you know, people who are award winning authors, they're bestsellers, and they had to kind of put in an application, basically. Well, sorry, I should go back on that. They could never apply one of them out. Uh, but once they've been sought out, then they'd have to apply for their storyline and what they're going to do with the characters. And all of that has to be vetted and discussed before they even, you know, write, before they start writing a chapter. They have to write their outline, get it all approved, uh, because it ties in with other books and other writers. Uh, so it is a very collaborative process. I think, it's, I mean, we had this, you know, these kids' books, uh, you know, I guess in America you call them sort of grade school. They're written by a guy mm -hmm. called Terry Bisson. Terry Bisson has won a Hugo Award. He's won a Nebula Award. He's written one story called Bears Discover Fire, which is about in the northwest of the United States, bears are roaming around and they learn how to make fire. And it's kind of what a unique idea for a story. <laughs> and there's another one yeah. called they're, they're Made Out of Meat, where these extracorporeal aliens come to Earth for trying to seek out intelligent life. They're not used to life being like physical. And so they see mm. all these meat things doing stuff. And then they decide to, to leave and pretend that there's no intelligent life there because they don't understand corporeal life. As, and it's like he's a yeah. he is a really legitimate writer. And here he is writing, you know, a little a little 150 page Star Wars book. But it's yeah. good. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it, this is the one that really kicked it off, which is uh, Heir to the Empire. So this is the sequel, essentially, to the original Star Wars trilogy. Uh, you've got ah. Han, Luke and Leia. And this is it. This is what got to the New York Times bestseller list very established author, Timothy Zahn, doing his Star Wars trilogy. Um, and it's 
generally regarded of whatever your personal favorite is a bit like goldfinger but this is the best you know we can all agree this one is the best it has that kind of status in the in the star wars community so so tell me about that okay where what is how do star wars books exist oh okay so it initially exists for the very very first one frankly because lucas was making star wars and he started to realize the studio was going cold and he realized they weren't going to promote it they didn't have faith in it um he personally did but he basically got to have the, the franchise rights because he wanted to promote the film and that that was it so he hired a uh, a writer to do the book uh the, the novelization of the film put that out i think the year before star wars came out um so and that went all around the sci-fi convention in america so it started to get a bit of traction there along with very limiting merchandising merchandising as we think of it today we think of star wars as a merchandising juggernaut that didn't come along for like a year or two later it actually took quite a long time to get that started um so anything that if you bought in 1977 it's probably a bootleg uh, like most most star wars stuff was except for those books um, and as I say, he rarely realized the studio was going cold on this. So as soon as the author had finished that, he wanted that author to do some kind of sequel that could be a TV sequel, reusing all the props and the costumes. And that was basically the brief, a cheap sequel story, reusing everything and kind of the provi proviso that the basic ending situation shouldn't change too much in case Lucas was able to kind of film it and then maybe use it as a springboard for a later film. So the first Star Wars sequel book is Splinter of the Mind's Eye, genuinely the most interesting one because, of course, the, the writer was given largely carte blanche, uh, apart from those basic kind of, you know, it was his sandpit to play in, apart from those basic restrictions. But he didn't know anything. He didn't know where Lucas was going to go in The Empire Strikes Back. He had no idea about this grand plan. So it rarely is a shot in the dark. And it became a bit of an anom anomaly later on. Uh, as this kind of weird and interesting Star Wars adventure, quite different from anything else. They've since gone back into a comic book version that fit it in a bit more nicely with the rest of Star Wars. Now, I seem to, I don't, I've never read that, but I seem to mm. remember it was kind of like a, almost like a bottle episode, wasn't it? Luke and Leia mm. crashing on a planet and Darth Vader's yeah. there as well. Yeah, yeah, and it's a big misty planet because that's a cheap thing to do for TV. So you don't need yeah. to build all the expansive sets. Just fill it with dry ice. And that's the idea. Very much the setup. And then uh, actually American Public Radio provided a fantastic, uh, fantastic insight into Star Wars. Sorry, connection just fuzzy a little. Can you hear me? I can hear you loud and clear. Cool, cool. Um, just a wave passing. But no, NPR did a fantastic uh, radio adaptation of the original Star Wars film. And they expanded to a 13-part, uh, I think, 13-hour radio show. Now, of course, stretching a two-hour film to 13 hours, this is, I listened to it fairly recently, and it explained probably for me the most mysterious thing about old Star Wars fans in America, which they'd often said, you know what, I like Dune, so I like Star Wars. And I never really understood that connection until I listened to the radio drama where he filled in not exactly with Dune, but you could see where it was coming from. He was obviously a Dune fan and filled in. And so a lot of the idea that we just know that, you know, Han Solo smuggled spice, for yeah. example. Everyone knows that. It's never in the film. We just know he smuggled spice. But how do we know? And a lot of it comes from the radio drama, all this kind of extra detail. Uh, that is, when I was a kid growing up, I had all the Star Wars toys and my older brother used to play with me and he used to tell me stuff like, oh, Darth Vader was an apprentice of Obi-Wan Kenobi and he got thrown into lava and stuff. I don't know where he learned it was from the, the radio yeah. plays and the things. But for me as a kid, you know, this is exciting. I was like, oh, wow, I yeah, get to yeah. learn all this stuff that you don't see in the movies till 20 years later. And that's the interesting thing you know, about the original fans, right? Because you didn't, you didn't have the internet. So Lucas said in interviews, oh yeah, it was lava. And he kept telling this story. And some of the original concepts for Return of the Jedi is that the Emperor lived in kind of this castle over lava. Um, but it wasn't going to be on the Death Star with Luke and Vader. It was going to be there. And it was kind of supposed to be resonance for that. Obviously got changed. But a lot of the concepts got put out there. Um, there's also the original comic book adaptation. So Marvel in the late 70s was actually starting to get a bit try for money um and they were able to get the adaptation for star wars and that it has been said that saved marvel that marvel would not have existed in the 80s if it hadn't gotten star wars and that's how we got jackson the six foot tall green space rabbit <laughs> fought along hand solo an iconic character from that particular era of star wars i i'm not quite i'm not quite <laughs> familiar with jackson i'm gonna have to google him 
<laughs> I think I had him on a on a lunchbox or thermos at one point. But uh, yeah, Jackson was a. Uh, he didn't appear that much, but he made an impact. <laughs> so when did books like Heir to the Empire get published? When did sort of the the real uh, bulk of of books about Star Wars start coming in? Yeah. So apart from those early anomalies, I say the guy who did the radio drama did the Han Solo trilogy. Uh, but apart from those early anomalies, after Return of the Jedi, you enter what's kind of known as dark times for Star Wars. Yeah. You know, you you have the Ewoks animation, a Canadian animation, uh, but you don't have much. And it really goes quiet until around 1991 when uh, Bantam starts publishing these Star Wars books and Air to the Empire is it. That's the one that kickstarted all of the others and also led to the resurgence in comic books because then you have Dark Empire, um, which again, if what Air to the Empire is for the Star Wars books, Dark Empire is for comics. That again kicked it off. It is, a, it is the sequel to Timothy Zahn's trilogy. Um, so again, kind of interesting, the multimedia approach that you have a trilogy of books then you have a comic book, a graphic novel, as the sequel. I thought, and they're all canon, which is because I know Star Trek used to churn out books. I used to read the Star Trek books, but they weren't canon. So whatever happened in a Star Trek paperback was not considered canon to the thing. Whereas, mm -hmm. as you were saying, everything at that time was considered canon to the Star Wars universe. Yeah, and it's there is a tier. I should say there's G canon, which is top tier. That G canon is just George. Yeah. Whatever George says, whatever he puts out there. That's canon. And he can override anything. Right? So if he creates a film and decides, nah, I don't like that, I'm going to do something different, that's his right. He's the original creator. He is the maker. Um, now you have T canon, which is television, uh, but that was rarely created just for the Clone Wars. Uh, yeah. so the Clone Wars then considered kind of next above that. They can't contradict the films. And if they, if anything came up that did, then the film would be right. But that was rarely with George Lucas's oversight. Um, then you have what's it's got an initial, but everyone knows it as the expanded universe, books, comics, novels, all that stuff, which is all created together under Lucasfilm's uh, you know, auspices. And it's created according to the Holocron, which was the central repository of all Star Wars stuff to make sure things didn't bump against each other. It's that's amazing. When you're talking yeah. so many characters and an entire universe, yeah, yeah. that's a lot to keep keep on top of. Yeah, and that's, you know, Lucas's oldest employee, uh, the lady I think started out as one of his secretaries on the original film, carried right the way through to the 90s and 2000s, one of the people overseeing the Holocron. Like, there's a full there's a full time team of people overseeing this. This leads to one of my favorite projects. So I have this book, Jedi Search. It's the beginning of a trilogy by Kevin J. Anderson. I'm not going to lie. Kevin J. Anderson is not my favorite author, but he has really interesting concepts. Uh, however, Probably my favorite Star Wars author is Michael A. Stackpole. Um, again, Timothy Zahn is you know the gold finger, but this is my personal favorite, right? Yeah. These two books are interesting because basically, in the Kevin Janderson books, if a chapter ends with somebody storming out of a room, then in I Jedi by Michael A. Stackpole, a chapter starts with somebody storming into a corridor and brushing past someone. <sighs> These are interlinking projects, which are, can also be explored through a video game and through various comics as well, but these rarely interlink tightly. That's amazing. What fun. I mean, as, yes. a, as a reader and a, as a fan, isn't it fun to like explore these things and learn more and see it all hangs together? Absolutely. And it gives you, again, because every writer has their own voice, right? Um, and I say so these two writers particularly have a very, very different voice. So to get those two voices about what is the same event, the facts are broadly the same, they broaden out each other. I think it's wonderful. Uh, and Michael Stackpole and Timothy Zahn write each other's characters. They go on cycling holidays together, which is a wonderful oh. thing for me to imagine. <laughs> so I admire both their work. It's, uh, I don't know, the modern day C.S. Lewis and J.R. Tolkien. I think it's, and the, the, well, the other thing is like all the books appeal to different audiences. So these are uh, like perfect for my 11 year old. He sat down to try and read Darth Plagueis and it was a little bit difficult for him. So I've been yeah. reading it out loud to him. I mean, this book, this book is quite hard going for me. Uh, there's one word I, I had to look up, but it's beautifully written. I mean, it's mm. almost Shakespearean. I'm reading it. I'm like, I'm loving reading it out loud. I'm just imagining I'm like Patrick, Sir Patrick Stewart. As, as yeah. I did. Um, James Lucino is really interesting, and he's kind of he's one of those people the expanded universe desperately needed, which is as you described writing as like a craft, right? Mm. He brilliant craftsman in that because it's fast, occasionally you get these odd little, and you just need a story to explain A to B, yeah, and 
Pacino is amazing at creating A to B and then drawing in as many different threads and creating something cohesive and satisfying. Uh, but it's a real craft. Yeah, and I'm I have been blown away the more I've discovered just about you know the level of craft, the level of quality of writing, the level of quality of craftsmanship, keeping things coherent, filling in the blanks, keeping I mean it is it's a massive undertaking that they mm. seem to have done so coherently. But then let's talk about the Fleming problem because um, you know, yeah. you've got this this huge universe and then they got taken over by I think Disney originally was well. Di yep. Disney are the ones who sucked up everything, like they sucked up the Marvel universe. Yeah. And did things change then? Immediately, immediately. Yeah. As soon as Disney bought it out, they said, "Okay, expanded universe, not canon. We're going to ignore it." And that 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 was a red flag for a lot of people. It was a red flag for me. Um, and because, as I say, basically, when James Bond saves London. When James Bond saves Istanbul, you're invested because Istanbul is a place. You know, it's it's a real place. I've I've been there. I know it. Yes. And so whatever is going on in the film, no matter how crazy, yeah, I can get invested in that. With Luke Skywalker saving the galaxy, you need it to be a real galaxy, right? With fantasy, you must be very, very strict with your with your rules, with your world building yeah. rules. And that's why, you know, say the expanded universe has been so wonderful, because it really filled out this universe, which had always felt pretty real. You watch the films and you think, maybe that guy has a story. Well, now he does. It connects to all these other cool stories. Uh, and so it had been a wonderful feature of it. Now, if Luke Skywalker saves a character, well, do you believe a story like pre-Disney or do you believe a story post-Disney, who this person is? Right. You've now got multiple different you know, multiverses um, going on. And that wasn't something that existed before. I know in one of these books, there's there's that chap in um, Attack of the Clones who tries to sell um, Obi Wan some death sticks in the in a bar. Yeah, like, do you want to buy some death sticks? <laughs> and Obi Wan's like, you should go home and reevaluate your life. Mm -hmm. And apparently, he was called uh, Elan Slizbagano. Yeah, <laughs> which is and now now he has a different a different name, and it's yeah. kind of one of the, one of those things. It's, it's almost like religion. I said, I came from a, I went to a, I went to a theological university and like I grew up in a very Anglican thing. And you look up, you know, the, the, not the Gnostic chapters and the not Gnostic chapters and all these different things. It's almost become like that. Hmm. And, then, and then you learn that Thomas might not have been his name. Um, <laughs> it just means twin. Um, but then you learn Thomas was known as Didymus. Oh, Didymus might not be his real name. It just means twin. Um, <laughs> yes, I can see the, I can see the similarity. Um, yeah, the early stars had a lot of problems with this. I'd say because you had those Marvel comics like the Six Foot Green Rabbit, and they were they were all over the place, and they became rarely sensible in nineteen ninety one. Uh, but what they did a really good job of is trying to kind of pull them back into it and trying to rationalize it all. Uh, Stephen J. Sansweet, who's uh, an American, has got the largest Star Wars collection in the world because he started collecting Star Wars stuff before the films came out. Like he was on the wow. sci-fi circuit, bought the book, bought whatever he could, and basically cleaned up. There weren't that many collectibles out there. So he cleaned up and then carried on ever since. He was employed by Lucasfilm to write the Star Wars Encyclopedia, uh, which is an amazing book, uh, which is kind of pre the Star Wars prequels, a map of everything out there. That's a... So let's say you are a Star Wars fan and it, it okay. is... Uh... Se oh, yeah, let's imagine you're a Star Wars fan. <laughs> it's September, it's no October 2012. You have spent 35 years invested in the Star Wars universe, reading all these books, reading the comic books and stuff like that. And then Disney owns it and says the expanded universe isn't canon anymore. What, yeah. what does that mean to you? What, what it immediately, it was an immediate red flag. And I was like, let's see what they come out with. Because, you know, I, I try and be reasonable. If they come out with something brilliant and it ties in, great. We can we can go with it. If it's rubbish, that's it. It's George Lucas's creation. He's the original author. I mean, just to, I know you will enjoy this. Just to show you how invested some of the authors got, right? Uh, I said Michael A. Stackpole is my favorite, you know, Star Wars writer for the Expanded Universe. He created a character called Coran Horn, who is his... Uh, his main character, right? It's his Luke Skywalker going through the universe. There was a card game for Star Wars, which, you know, generally took stills from the films. You know, you play your Luke Skywalker, you play your whatever. They produced Coran Horn, and they had Michael A. Stackpole as Coran Horn for that. So this is oh. the author playing his own character. And they did that with a few different writers. They had those writers as their characters. Um, I love so, yeah, that. This is 
of my favorite Star Wars collectibles. Uh, yeah, so now, now I know what he looks like. <laughs> so yeah, I said the artist got so involved, and for me, the expanded universe was wonderful because you 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 knew it was being looked after by artists who passionately cared. Um, with Disney, you do have the TV shows, The Mandalorian, for example. Everyone everyone seems to enjoy. Um, but then you do have the involvement. Obviously, John Favreau is the showrunner, and he's yeah. got quite track record, right? I mean, whether it's uh, was it Elf is his Christmas film, and Iron yeah. Man is his you know, initial thing. I mean, he's got such a track record. But he also made sure he's in meetings all the time with Dave Filoni, who ran the Clone Wars and was George Lucas's apprentice for like ten years. Um, so yeah, those things are wonderful, and it's really interesting. You notice whenever you see the name Dave Filoni on a Disney thing. You can also notice that he is pulling in as much expanded universe stuff as he possibly can, which makes it new canon as well. <laughs> well I mean, that's an that's again where it's almost like religion. It's almost like the Council of mm. Nicaea, where they're going through the the uh, different books mm. and chapters and deciding what to include. And he's like, because for me as a fan, it would be frustrating. It all gets thrown out. Oh. So what what did get thrown out and what didn't get thrown out? The expanded universe, but say like the yeah. Clone Wars. What yeah, is uh, so. The Clone Wars were carried over because it's cinematic. So Disney decided to keep everything cinematic. There was a hearing they said that maybe the Clone Wars wouldn't be, but ultimately they did. Um, I think it was it fit Disney's model. Uh, but they basically a blanket to no to everything because the books carried on for over a hundred years after the films end. Um, so of course I understand they needed to make their trilogy at that point in time. And um, for me it seemed unfortunate because in the time of the expanded universe they changed publishers. And they changed publisher. The first publisher did about 20 years worth of, you know, within the story world, 20 years of a coherent plot line. And then the next publisher basically did the next 20 years. So they all accepted it within the same universe, but the very different creative team. Oh, that's and how how did that manifest itself in the differences? So spoilers for the general outlines. If it's Bantam, the original uh, publisher, who I rarely loved. It carries on straight from Return of the Jedi. The Imperials don't just give up. Like, it's not that they won one battle and all go home. So you have the Imperial Remnant, and you also have various warlords, and you have, I say, a whole splinter of the galaxy. And it's the creation of the New Republic. Yeah, and it's really about that spread of civilization throughout the galaxy, the rebuilding of everything that was lost. Um, and that's that for me. That's a wonderful story. I really like that. Within that, you can have romance books like the Courtship of Princess Leia. Uh, you can have uh, well, now you have some horror books. That was the last, uh, the last thing they did. Really, was accepting having horror books in Star Wars. Uh, but when it came to twenty years after, one of the issues it had was almost the James Bond issue, which is like, okay, it's Thursday, that means this guy's the villain. It's Friday, that guy's the villain. It can suffer from that. I can understand that. Um, yeah. And also, I guess, you know, the expanding universe, you said it, it continued 100 years after the end of Return of the Jedi. For, mm. for, for the people, if they're going to make a new sequel trilogy, I guess that yeah. causes problems. Because in the, the expanded universe, Luke Skywalker was adept and brave and functional. <laughs> and whereas in the sequels, he was like this grumpy old man living like a hermit in the, in the woods. Yeah. Yes, and that was a bizarre break. Like that that's not the Luke Skywalker we've all had in our heads. Um so that was that was challenging for fans, to say the least. Yeah. And I mean, how do you consolidate I mean, are you a fan of the sequel movies? Not at all. Don't exist. Yeah. I've seen them I've seen them all once. Um uh, but no, I, I just they didn't grab me. They didn't have that overall big picture that George Lucas always puts in. Um so as I say, for me, I, I for me the, the expanded universe carries on and I really love it. Um, in many ways, the TV shows are much better. You seem to have showrunners who really understand this and are pulling in the expanded universe. You mentioned about, you know, splitters, splitters within the fandom. The most interesting development I've seen recently is, you know, lots of people got into filmmaking because they like Star Wars. You know, lots of people are legitimate professionals now. I mean, the guy who directed Rogue One, he became a director because he loves Star Wars. Um, so they have lots of professionals. And what some of these guys are doing is they're taking the Disney TV shows and re-editing them oh, into their own preferred versions. That's interesting. So, now, I wouldn't do it myself, of course, but on the naughty parts of the internet, you can download this, because, of course, it's all copyrighted, uh, but you have their versions of it, and it's amazing what they can do with editing, um, including, yeah, including redoing the special effects. That's, the special effects in the TV show aren't up to scratch. They'll redo them. 
God, can you just imagine that you're in the dark part of the web downloading, downloading like like Star Wars things, and your your wife comes in and goes, "What are you doing?" And it's like I'm looking at porn. Yes, yes, that's, <laughs> that's the meme. <laughs> yes, yes, it's the countless Star Wars edits and re-edits, and of course George Lucas has done this. Um, um, I say, it, sorry, but there's a wonderful world of non-canon adventures which are close to canon. Uh, my favourite being. Uh, the Lego Star Wars. Oh, yes. <laughs> because they're not canon officially, but they follow canon. They can't break canon. They can't be too satirical, but things like the Padawan Menace, they do actually fit within the expanded universe, but they, they're not canon themselves. Isn't that it's, funny? It's interesting. We've got the Star Wars Star, Skywalker saga on the video game thing, and oh, it's yeah. amazing. All of the different obscure characters, and they all have their little lines of dialogue and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. There's so much thought that's gone into every single every single thing. Yeah. I mean, just to say how multimedia this can go, I've got one of the very, very, very rare items. This is a Star Wars radio drama. So it's, yeah, just like, uh, was it PBS in America? Or NPR, sorry. NPR Radio 4 for the UK, uh, but it's just a, a full radio drama. And it, it, to be honest, it costs so much they couldn't do it again. They they blew the budget for a series on this. Because um, it it's a full into, cast, isn't it? Multiple actors. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Music, sound effects, it, the full works. It is a full production. Um, and it's nice and again for comics, video games, all sorts. Um, so, I mean, that's interesting. When, okay, so when Disney took over, when they threw out the expanded universe, mm. they're rebuilding things now. Um, how do you think they approached that and did they succeed or fail? First, they failed. That's the easy bit. Yeah. No, nobody likes, <laughs> nobody <laughs> likes what they've done, but I know. I think they probably did it with the best of intentions. Um, I, I was troubled and a lot of people were troubled when uh, Kathleen Kennedy, who is a uh, who runs Lucasfilm now? Um, she was interviewed about the Star Wars sequel trilogy and said, "It's it's not as easy as people think. There's no source material. There's no comics. There's no books that we can adapt." And she said this in Rolling Stone magazine. It's a it's a clear source. And the reaction again, a bit like you know when they said we're going to nuke canon, it had a stranger. Uh, it had a bit of an effect. Um, so the yeah, the Sack Kathleen Kennedy movement is is uh, I find it too boring to get involved to be honest. But it is a movement. Uh, I can, and, and I mean, is there a lesson that we can take from the reaction that fans had for Star Wars messing things around with Ian Fleming? Yeah, I mean, as I said, the fans are carrying on as they always were, and they're they're like, they they look at Disney and say no, and carry on yeah. going their own directions. And it can be very fractious to share about Star Wars things now online, but generally they find their own pockets and they carry on without the big Disney player, yeah. right? They've got their own copies of what they like. Uh, they're happy to share fan fiction, fan edits, and so on. Um, you know, so in many ways, you can buy these franchises. You can do with what you want, but people won't follow. Yeah, it's not good. They'll they'll just move on. Either they'll move on to other interests, or they'll build their own stuff. Like the world of Star Wars fan films is amazing. I think there's one with uh, Mads Mikkelsen's brother, uh, which has been taking the internet by storm. I I've been watching online recently a YouTube series where somebody just takes Air to the Empire and animates it. Like as soon as Disney took over, I, like many other people, said, you've got Clone Wars, you've got Air to the Empire, just combine the two, animate Air to the Empire, I'll pay. I'll pay money for that. And it's been years and years they've not done it. So a fan has just done it himself. I find that that's amazing. And this day and age, you could do that. I know Star Trek yeah. fans, there's John Broughton, uh, who JB Bespoke is his Instagram, and he has a, an entire Starship Enterprise bridge and has been running for like 10 years a show about the Starship Farragut. Now he's yeah. at the movie generation. And it looks like the stuff you would see on television. Yeah, yeah. Now, when Lucas was running the show, this was encouraged, right? There were fan yeah. film awards and troops is probably the first one to go to. It was the first one to rarely break. I Move remember in. seeing that. It's like cops, except with stormtroopers. <laughs> exactly. Just just driving around in Tatooine on their regular rounds. And uh, then there's things like, was it Christmas Tauntauns, which is one of those earworms. It's rarely dangerous song. <laughs> uh, it does go round and round in the head forever. The animator said that he regretted doing it because he had to listen to the music so many times to animate <laughs> the lips in his early days. Um, he said it became a bit of a nightmare for him going to the award ceremony because they kept playing it. <laughs> That's hysterical. Now, I, I mean, the whole idea, though, of fans going off on their own, that seemed, that should be a warning. And I mean, I know, you know, 
the Ian Fleming publications are about to, to do these new 70th anniversary books in the UK only, not here in America. They're doing nothing in the, in America. But it's like, as a fan, I don't want, I would happily give them my, the, my money yeah. for like the unabridged books with new covers. I'd be like, yes, I'm super yeah. excited about that. But then they made this decision and it's like, did, do Disney, when it comes to Star Wars fans, and does Ian Fleming Publications, when it comes to James Bond fans, do they understand mm. that they are like casting aside their their loyalist fans? Yeah, yeah, and I, I say for Disney, that's been a, a massive problem. They've lost uh, yeah. the fan, and they've come out against fans often, saying, "Oh, toxic fans and all this stuff." And, and yeah, and articles, and it's we loved our stuff. Uh, all the common players are fans of sex. Uh, the fans couldn't deal with the female protagonist. And if you ask any fan of the expanded universe, you know, Luke Skywalker gets married. That woman is everyone's favorite character from this expanded universe. She's amazing and definitely fits, you know, a strong, three dimensional, interesting person. And Ahsoka, you're watching The Clone Wars. Um, oh, yeah. So yeah. And yeah, she's I mean, brilliant. brilliant. She develops so much. She's like this scrappy little annoying kid. And then by the end, she's like this noble war. And then you see her in. I get the Mandalorian, and it's like, yeah, yeah she's, she's a different person still, and we love her. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so I think it's been a real problem. And they've tri uh, Disney have tried to create the the High Republic era, and this was uh, the main ideas behind this series was diversity and representation and all the all the buzzwords. I don't know a single fan who's read them, um, yeah. and it it's because honestly, if that's the most interesting thing about them, we're not interested. Everyone loves Lando. Everyone loves, I say, Mara Jade. We love these characters, you know, because they're interesting people. Yes. Yeah. And then they had, I know in the, the sequel trilogy, like, I liked Finn. And mm. that was interesting because he was like a, a black character in Star Wars and previously had been like Lando and that was about it. And then they kind of did nothing with him. Yeah, uh, it's bizarre. Um, it's like he was so great in the first movie and he didn't really, had a, a much more reduced role in the second movie. In the third movie, it was like, oh, look, he's in it. Yeah, and that, that idea came from Lawrence Kasdan, who was the kind of script doctor who's brought in, uh, well, he did Raiders of the Lost Ark, he did some of the Star Wars films. Um, he'd always wanted to kill Han Solo. That was, that was one thing he'd always wanted to do. Um, so as soon as I saw his name on there, I was like, oh, I wonder what's going to happen. <laughs> um, <laughs> but his idea was a stormtrooper who becomes good or becomes something. Uh, but he, wasn't he didn't carry on with that story group, um, which is unfortunate, I think. So, and it seems like the expanded universe seems so cohesive, whereas yes. the the sequel trilogy themselves, like it even con the third movie contradicted the second movie. Yeah, you could see the artists directly arguing with each other. I, I was distracted from watching the film because I could see the drama behind the scenes as I was watching. Which you know, for the first time watching a film isn't what you want. Whereas, as I say, with the expanded universe, you know, you see something in a film, it ties into something in a comic, which then ties into a book, which ties into the Clone Wars. Have you come across Quinlan Voss yet? Uh, oh yes, yes. Oh, okay, what? I'm. Hang on, I'm gonna. Um, I'm just the dreadlock dude. Uh, yes. There we go. <laughs> if a male Jedi master. Yeah. So he was in the Clone Wars as a very incidental character because before that series came out, there'd been a comic book series, which I think was brilliant, all about him. And it was one of the first things about the Clone Wars because basically the comic book writers hadn't been told by Lucas what he was going to do. So they hesitated to do anything because they knew a film was coming. It could contradict anything. So they created their own hero and had a magnificent arc with him. Um, I must admit the Clone Wars... I found it a bit weird because it seems like a surfer dude. My wife suggested he's like an Indian tracker, which I feel a bit better about. Uh, but in, I said the comic book character is a very, very strong and interesting character. And of course, in the Kenobi, have you watched the Kenobi series? I have, of course, yes. Okay, so there is reference to Quinlan in that, and there's no way that isn't Quinlan boss. Which, I mean, that's... the thing. So, Shadows of the... No, it was uh, Heir to the Empire was what happened after yeah. Return of the Jedi, right? So they did... But I heard your slip. <laughs> oh wait! I have... <laughs> yeah, I mean that's own that, and now is that expanded universe? Yes, that's expanded universe. That's just a really interesting one, right? So, 1996, this comes out basically as a test for does the general public remember Star Wars, right? Last Star Wars film would be 1983. Yeah, there'd been a bunch of fuss around it, but they're going to re-release the Star Wars special editions the next year, 70, 97. But that's not a thing. You don't that you weren't doing that in the nineties. You weren't releasing decade-old films. 
Uh, so this was really a test. So you had a novel, a comic, a video game, and a music CD that you listen to as you read the book. You had this complete work and toys, of course. You had everything except the film to test. Do we still care? And people cared, I guess. Cared enough, yeah, scared enough. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, I remember I, I went to the cinema to see the re release of those, and then there were the the, the prequels, and I love the prequels mm. to be honest. Yeah, me too. Yeah, uh, I really enjoy it, and I can see kind of that everyone complains they're hokey, but I almost watch them almost as if I'm watching a play, a, a Shakespeare play. Because, yes, mm. okay, to a certain extent, it's like projecting the things, but it's a wonderfully cohesive story and it has it tells you everything about the lead up to stuff it's so much grander on scale than the original three movies yeah and i'd say that gets into lucas's big picture idea right you've got episode one which is about a nine-year-old and everything in that film is from a nine-year-old's perspective you know yeah people complain about jar jar nine-year-olds love him yeah because it's a nine-year-old film the next film is a teen movie because anakin is a teen and so everything associated with whether it's the hot rods or the diner or whatever it's a bit like american graffiti um you know everything is like a teen movie and then you have the one star film it's really an adult film uh which is episode three which i i love everyone's always saying what's your what are your what's order do you uh rank the star wars films and i'm like revenge of the sith revenge of the sith revenge of the sith revenge of the sith <laughs> <laughs> but they had a cohesive expanded mm. universe story about what yeah. happened after return of the jedi and how was it it was for me it was wonderful so what you see yeah. is the trying to rebuild something that's been lost it is post-war uh, mm. so luke skywalker for example needs to rebuild a jedi order so these people have been hunted. They're not necessarily trusting because they have been hunted for so long. Some of the Jedi who are hunted had turned to the dark side. So they need to be redeemed. The most interesting story for me is Streen, who is somebody who has such a natural ability, but he hates it. He has the ability to read minds. And if ever he's in a crowd, he reads everybody's mind. can't stop it. So he goes off to be a recluse away from all other people. So Luke Skywalker uniquely promises to train him how to stop using his powers. Oh, what a great idea for a character absolutely so stories like that which fit within it so that's one part of luke Skywalker's jedi academy anyone who plays video games might have be excited at that because there's a, a video game series about it as i say it all ties in for princess leia of course you know she's a sister she is a twin sister she has a jedi ability but for her she wants to be a politician she wants to to shape and negotiate and because that's the strength of the film right yeah um so we see in the say the thrawn era you see that's the uh, heir to the empire uh, so you see her being mentored by mon mothma the leader of the rebel alliance so we see that mentor student relationship han is an interesting one because of course we saw him go from being kind of a, a smuggler to being a respectable general uh so he's an interesting character in that mix and it's so frustrating in the movie that they just reverse that it's like they they deliberately deconstructed all of these heroes that in the expanded yeah. universe were so noble and had grown so much yeah so, so that's where i feel disney really lost the big picture right they, they removed the artistry so i feel the artists put in arcs and stories that were compelling even as a very small boy i loved watching stars because you saw how people grew right as you when you were a child there's such a big difference between being seven and eight yeah <laughs> so to see that with your movie here is yeah there's such a big difference between him in the first film and him in the last film it was satisfying so to just to suddenly just just reset yeah, Han's now back to being a smuggler. Princess Leia's back to being a rebel general, and Luke's on some rock somewhere. Yeah, yeah, it didn't sit well. So, well, we're, we're coming up to an hour. So, mm. I was going to say, answer yeah, this sorry. question for me. Oh no, no, I could. We could talk <laughs> about this. But in fact, we might have to have a, a, a sequel to this. Uh, we might have to have a trilogy of sequels to this. <laughs> but is the star is the Disney Star Wars universe redeemable? I think so. I like to think so. I'm an optimist, generally. Uh, and they've been producing more and more stuff that agrees with the old universe. Um, and a lot of that is actually being original. You know, I waved about my favourite book. My favourite book doesn't star Luke Khan or Princess Leia. It's, a, it's an original character, the one, that, uh, the one that the writer himself portrayed. They're using their own originality. They're using stars as a springboard. And it stays within that, you know, it stays within that sandpit, you know, it doesn't stray out, but it plays with it and shapes it, it uses their own creativity. 
I mean, when you mentioned Dave Filoni, it's almost like he's he's almost like a, a monk at the Council of Nicaea, sneaking in little bits of little bits of of gospel to that that get uh, clung to. And I guess if you have that thread of mm. once something just a thread becomes canon, then he can pull in more and more of it. Yes, absolutely. And as uh, every single episode that comes out, whether it's the Bad Batch or the Mandalorian or the Ahsoka series come up, you do see him smuggling in little ideas from the old universe. And that's just very satisfying to see because it just feels more coherent. It feels like there is a universe to save. Yeah. So um, if you are a filthy casual like me and you're kind of intrigued about this, where do you get started learning more about Star Wars in, the, in book and comic format? <laughs> I feel Heir to the Empire by Timothy Zahn, all the Timothy Zahn books are pretty, pretty good. Uh, but Heir to the Empire is the one that started everything. So it is a bit like saying go to Goldfinger. Um, of course, there's always individual recommendations. Anyone can message me anytime. Like if you're a Fleming fan, maybe Shatterpoint is Ooh, a good Mace one. Windu. Yeah, it's Mace Windows story by Matthew Stover, who's like a martial arts nutcase who <laughs> writes books. And there's a lot of that in here. Um, and it, kind of his apocalypse now within star wars uh, whereas if you love romance books the courtship of princess leia i mean it is a romance um uh, and if you want a romance comic union i can say whatever you like there's something within it but s the empire is the starting for all of it that's so interesting i might i might look up the courtship of princess leia because i love princess leia she's so acerbic <laughs> yeah. and like her relationship with han was so great the way they were butting heads yeah. but like put into it so As um princess the princess herself, Carrie Fisher, said, I didn't want to play a, a, a woman in distress, so I played a distressing woman. <laughs> <laughs> so what do you think, what do you think is going to happen to the Star Wars universe under Disney? Where are we? Where do you... Yeah, I'm hoping it's just going to slowly settle down. They'll respect what had been created before. I hope they'll move forward into new places, right? They don't have to keep saying, we'll erase this, we'll erase that. Go in another direction. It's a whole galaxy. There's a galaxy yeah. full of tales ready to be told. One of my, my underrated favorites, and it is so for kids, and I love it, is the Freemaker Adventures. And it's a Lego Star Wars story. Most of Star Wars writers, people butting heads and smashing things up. Lego is all about building stuff. So the Freemakers is about people who go along after battles, clean up all the Lego bricks, and build new stuff. <laughs> Oh, that's kind of exciting. <laughs> well, it's just such a new concept. I'm always like, you see that after all these years, there's still new stuff you can come out with. I mean, it is a literal universe. There's like yeah. a literal universe of things to explore. Exactly. And so I want to see them exploring it. I hope they're more mindful than they were originally because it seemed they, they came in with a wrecking ball and then thought, what do we do now? Yeah. They didn't have a plan, um, which when it had been so beautifully constructed before, and I think there have been... There have been discussions, loud discussions at times, about how it should go. But it had been a really interesting process, seeing that made by so many artists. So I hope we get a new golden era for Star Wars. Now, when it comes back to, to Mr. Fleming, what do you think is going to be the, the eventual outcome there? I hope that they will realize that he's the man who has given them a living. Yes. It's almost right. as if they're embarrassed by him. And it's the same with yeah. Barbara Broccoli. It's like, oh, we, we haven't got a script. We haven't decided an actor. It's almost like yeah. they're embarrassed by this franchise that made them billions of dollars. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a line from, what is it, Thor Ragnarok, I think, where the Kate Blanchett says, you're proud of what you've got, but you're ashamed of how you got it. Yes. Um, <laughs> I feel that's them right now. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I'm. I think it's wonderful that they just released that movie. Till they had Joe Biden having a, a you know, a, a showing of it in the White House, and he was talking about how proud he was, and it's a, a significant movie about a significant uh, event in in America's troubles and past. But of course, that movie wouldn't have been able to have been made unless James Bond had paid for it. Yeah, I do. I do have a thought on that, which comes from my my endless study of George Lucas uh, in the late. 80s, early 90s, he was working on the Young Indiana Jones Chronicles. Oh, uh, which is a great series. Yeah. And then he did the Star Wars Special Edition. These were tests. These were tests for certain types of technology and for putting out storylines. They're experiments. He didn't have to do like a big juggernaut. He wanted to experiment with something a lot smaller. Um, so I would hope, I mean, maybe this is being too optimistic, uh, that these showrunners they're having the experiments they need to have. Maybe there's something there that they'll take into a future Bond franchise. But it's okay for an artist 
to test, right? I, yeah. I, we've talked about like David Zerinsky's book club, right? Um, I love the spy club. Yeah, I think it's brilliant because I, for me, I, I feel as I read the Fleming books, right, that he's finding his formula, right? He gets from Russia Love, he's hit it big, and then he's like wave, havering where to go next. And for me, like The Spy Who Loved Me is where it goes really out there and he tests himself as an artist to see what's possible and whether you think it works or doesn't work. He's created something genuinely new. I, I think it's a remarkable book and I think it's, you know, obviously everyone is expecting spy adventures and stuff like that and they got this instead. But I mean, especially for a book about a woman written by a man, I think yeah. it holds up. Yeah, I mean, it made me think of uh, Alec Guinness in Nine Hearts and Coronets and he plays, you know, he plays with seven different members of a family, one of whom is a woman. I remember watching that thinking he plays a better woman than most women. <laughs> Why? Well, <laughs> I think that's that's one of the things we have culturally these days. You know, you don't, you know. It's, uh... <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes. Well, I, I've come into this having lived in China. We're not. This isn't a thing. So, so whenever I'm seeing these debates of we're updating it for current year, uh, well, well, only here, like a billion point seven people aren't interested in this debate. You know, I've of course spent much of my life in the Islamic world. Where this stuff really doesn't fly um and as i say there's very different worlds within planet earth in current year um, which is why i find it so strange trying to make it completely culturally acceptable for the united states current year because i think but the joy of life is looking at what's the point in art if you're not looking at other worlds and other other ways of doing things you know yeah i mean and it's so bizarre it's like there were books <laughs> written in the cold war and it's you yeah. know the, the sensibilities were different yeah, yeah, and it, and it makes sense that, you know, if you went through the Blitz and you were an observer at D-Day, then maybe you have a different point of view from those of us who grew up in happier times. You know, yeah. and it, and that, that's perfectly okay. I'm not saying everyone should have grown up in the Blitz, and I'm not saying we should have the same values, but it's interesting, right? As I say, as I travel around the world, I get to remote villages in China. Life is very different there, and I think it, it does you good to try and understand life on the other side of the fence is different. And that's why you read them. Like, you would read Ernest Hemingway's For Whom the Bell Tolls because it's about the lost generation of people after mm. World War One trying to find their way in the, in this world. And, you know, that's a snapshot of history. And you can't then go in and yeah. rewrite it with modern sensibilities because those sensibilities didn't exist. We, you and I, yeah. fortunately, have never had to fight in the trenches of World War One, So we don't understand what it's like to be in the yeah. lost generation. But we can read about it and, and be enlightened. I mean, uh, was it the film The Battle of Britain, which is directed by Guy Hamilton, who did one, one of my uh, favorite movies? If you watch it on streaming, the name of the dog has been changed. Oh, yes, because that was. Mm. <laughs> yes, but it wasn't an offensive thing in the UK at that time. It was just it was the name of a color, and it just wasn't offensive. And you also know that because when they were filming Live and Let Die, there was an English film crew went over to the United States. Now, one of the English film crew had that as his nickname. And somebody shouted it from the other side of the film set. And the, <laughs> the American producers had to rush out and say, look, I know it's your name, but you just can't use that here. Which <laughs> isn't that funny, these little stuff. <laughs> it is, it is. But it's a value placed upon, value placed upon words. Um, yeah. You know, being called a heretic these days doesn't have quite the same value that it used to have. No, you, often <laughs> don't, get, you don't get burnt at the stake quite as much. Exactly. So obviously, these things do change over time. But for me, it's just really interesting to look at a different place, a different time. And learn something from it, right? It's uh, as if to me that's, well, that's a wonderful thing about art. <laughs> that is, and that's what exists. Well, what a wonderful sentiment to wrap things up with. I'm afraid we have to cut the short an hour, but will you come back and, and can we chat about more stuff? Absolutely. We've we've just we've just touched the surface of Star Wars, I assure you. Oh, that is wonderful. Thomas, thank you so much for, for giving me a, an hour of your time and, and all of the wisdom of your brain. <laughs> thank you very much for putting up with me for so long <laughs> right Pleasure. and uh yeah and if you like what tom's had to say make sure you leave a comment down below hit that like button i'm gonna have a link to fleming never dies your your, your wonderful podcast Al uh albion never dies yeah yeah yes and uh that is also a youtube channel and i love the way you have you keep them separate oh yes yes so uh yep so the, the podcast comes out every week and that's uh you know that's very interactional. People message me all the time. I respond to those messages in the podcast and so on. YouTube is often where I want something just, just to remain a little bit longer. I want to show something. So I just put something there when I have something to say, and that's that. I really enjoyed your review of Zen and the Art of uh, Motorcycle Maintenance. Oh, thank you very much. And that was great. 
yeah it wasn't a nice little it was a nice little easter egg to actually have that book in there and be able to read it and... <laughs> thank you yeah I, I really enjoyed uh enjoyed, enjoyed doing it i read the book i let it sit in my mind for six months to a year and as i say that that's how much time i'll take over this stuff if it's on the youtube <laughs> i let it settle and i just put it out when it's time you know oh well that is one well. thank you so much thomas and hopefully we'll have you back very soon may the force be with you I'm Roland Hume. I've sold 67.